Section 3.1, Measures of Central Tendency. By the end of this lesson, you're going to be able to determine the arithmetic mean of a variable from raw data, determine the median of a variable from raw data, explain what it means for a statistic to be resistant, determine the mode of a variable from raw data, and use the mean and median to help identify the shape of the distribution. Now, when we look at a distribution of data, we should consider three characteristics of the distribution, shape, center, and spread. Now, in the last chapter, we discussed methods for organizing raw data into tables and graphs. These graphs, such as the histogram, allow us to identify the shape of the distribution. Now, distribution shapes can be described as symmetric, such as the one you see here in the top left and the top right graph. Now, in the top left, we have a uniform distribution. On the top right over here, we have a bell-shaped distribution. Or we can also have a skewed right, which is on the bottom left, or skewed left on the bottom right here. Now, the center and spread are numerical summaries of the data. The center of the data set is commonly called the average. There are many ways to describe the average value of a distribution. In addition, there are many ways to measure the spread of a distribution. The most appropriate measure of center and spread depends on the distribution shape. Once these characteristics of the distribution are known, that is, the shape, center, and spread, we can analyze the data for interesting features, including unusual data values called outliers. Now, in section 3.1, we focus on measures of central tendency. A measure of central tendency numerically describes the average or typical data value. We hear the word average in the news all the time. The average miles per gallon for the 2017 Chevrolet Corvette in highway driving is 22. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the national average commute time to work in 2015 was 25.9 minutes. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the average household income in 2015 was 56,515. So in this section, we discussed the three most widely used measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode. As we shall see, these three measures of central tendency can often give very different results. Objective 1. Determine the arithmetic mean of a variable from raw data. In everyday language, the word average often represents the arithmetic mean. To compute the arithmetic mean of a set of data, the data must be quantitative. The arithmetic mean of a variable is computed by adding all the values of the variable in the data set and then dividing by the number of observations. We have the population arithmetic mean, which we have a symbol pronounced mu, is a parameter that is computed using data from all individuals in a population. Then we have the sample arithmetic mean, which is X bar, is a statistic that is computed using data from individuals in a sample. While other types of means exist, the arithmetic mean is generally referred to as the mean. We will follow this practice for the remainder of the course. Now, we usually use Greek letters to represent parameters and Roman letters such as X or S to represent statistics. The notation used below for the arithmetic mean may look intimidating, it is important to understand the notation in a formula because it is then easier to remember and use it. Now for the population mean, if we have X subscript 1, X subscript 2, all the way to X subscript capital N, are the capital N observations of a variable from a population, then the population mean mu is the following formula. Mu is going to equal x1 plus all the way to xn divided by the population observations, which is equal to this symbol. This symbol represents the summation, meaning that you're going to add everything in the numerator and then divide it by the n observations. So here is the formula for the population mean. Again, we use the Greek letter mu to represent the mean of the population. To compute the population mean, we add up all the values and then divide by how many values there are. And then we use the capital letter N to denote the population size. Now before we read the next paragraph, we have the sample mean. 
The sample mean is you have x subscript 1 all the way to x subscript lowercase n, where lowercase n are observations of a variable from a sample. Then the sample mean is the following. We have x bar, which is equal to the number of observations divided by the total in the sample. And again, here is the summation. So here's the formula for the sample mean. Instead of mu, we use the symbol x bar to denote a sample mean. To compute the sample mean, we add up all the values and divide by how many there are. In this case, we use the lowercase letter n to denote the size of the sample. So here are two formulas in sigma notation. Sigma is the summation. The Greek symbol sigma, which is this kind of look, this kind of E symbol, is used in mathematics to denote a sum. So this numerator tells us to take the sum of all the x values and divide by how many there are. Now remember, capital N if it's a population mean and lowercase n if it's a sample mean. Now throughout this course, we agree to round the mean to one more decimal place than that in the raw data. First example, okay, we want to be able to compute a population mean and a sample mean. So let's take a look at the first question, okay. The first question, table one, shows the first exam scores of the 10 students enrolled in introductory statistics. Here's the student, and then there is the score. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to be able to, in part A, compute the population mean, which is mu. And so the first thing we're going to do is then we're going to add up all the values. So we're going to add up the sum of all the data values. So it's x subscript i, which would be the first data value, plus the second data value, plus the third data value, all the way to the tenth data value, since we have ten data values in our sample. So that means we're going to add up all the scores. So we have 82 plus 77 plus 90 plus 71, plus 62, plus 68, plus 74, plus 84, plus 94, and then plus 88. We add them all together, we get 790, okay? And so now what we want to do is now we're going to use our formula for mu. Now remember that the sample size that we have n is 10. So using our formula to find the mean, the population mean, we're going to take the sum of those data values that we just found and then divide it by the sample size, the population size, excuse me. So we have 790 and then we're going to divide that by 10, which is going to give us 79. And again, we agree to round the mean to one more decimal place than that in the raw data, so we could just write this as 79.0. Okay, so therefore there is the mean. Okay, next, we want to find a simple random sample of size n is equal to four students. Now recall that a, ca a calculator with a random generator or computer software can be used to obtain simple random samples. Now in the past we've used StatCrunch, in this case, we're going to use the TI-84 plus graphing calculator, and we're going to find a simple random sample of size n is equal to 4 from a population size of n is equal to 10, and we will use the TI-84. So we're going to come in here, okay, and we're going to go ahead and then select math, okay, and then we're going to go to probability, and then we're going to go all the way down to R-A-N-D-I-N-T. Now, if you go to number 8, this doesn't repeat any values, but we're going to go ahead and use 5 and see if we do end up getting a repeat. So the first number that we got to put in is the number 1 because it's 1 through 10. So 1 is the lowest number. The highest number is 10 because there's 10 values. And again, we want to find a simple random sample of size n is equal to 4, so we're going to put the value of 4 here. And then we're going to select enter. So. As you can see here, it gives us 7, 2, 2, and 8. So that means that we're going to pick the following values. 
We're going to pick seven so far because that's Joel. Okay. And then we have two, but that's repeated twice. So that's Ryan. And then if we look at the next one, we have eight. So therefore there is Sam. Okay. But we need one more because we can't do that repeat. So we're going to have to do this again. We're going to go back to math. Okay. And then we're going to select probability and then go all the way down to R-A-N-D-I-N-T. And then again, one comma 10 comma four and then hit enter. And now the first number again is eight. That's a repeat. And next number is eight. That's a repeat. Now we're going to look at number one. So therefore there is one. So it's going to be Michelle. So as you can see here, I'm going to go ahead and copy this information. So again, from our calculator, we can see the following results. We know that we're using seven and then the two and then the eight and then the one because we can't keep the ones that are repeated. So therefore, it's going to be Michelle, Ryan, Joel, and Sam for the simple random sample. Okay, next, what we want to do is in part C, we want to be able to compute the sample mean. Okay, now the sample mean of what we found in part B. Okay, so to find the sample mean, okay, what we have to do is the following. Okay, we're going to add the data values from the individuals in the sample and then divide that by n is equal to 4. Okay, because that is the sample size, all right? So what we're going to do is now we're going to take a look at Michelle, Ryan, Joel, and then Sam. So the first step is we know that we're going to pick those values. So we're going to first find the sum of those data values. Okay, so the first one is 82. So we have 82 plus the second data value is 77 plus the next data value is 74 plus the next data value is 84 because that is what we got in our sample. Okay, now let's add those up. So when we add that up, that gives us a total of 317. Okay, and so now what we want to do is now we want to be able to find the sample mean and the sample mean is taking the value of the sum of the data values divided by the sample size. Now recall that the sample size in our problem now is 4. So that's going to equal the value of 317 and we're going to divide that by 4 which is going to give us the value of 79.25 and recall that we want to round this to one decimal place so this is going to be 79.3 okay now remember when we divide this result by the number of individuals in the sample we round the sample mean to the nearest tenth which is one more decimal point than in the original data and therefore there is our sample mean Okay, next, let's discuss the visualization of the mean as the center of gravity in an animation. Now, it helps to think of the mean as the center of gravity. So, in other words, the mean is the value such that a histogram of the data is perfectly balanced with equal weight on each side of the mean. Now we're going to look at figure two and it's going to show the histogram of the data in table one. So let me pull that up. So over here you can see this is called a fulcrum. Okay. And so what happens here is that recall that the mean of the data table in table one is 79, which is what we got in the first part. We're going to play with the fulcrum triangle to verify that the mean is the balancing point of the data. So here I take the fulcrum and I move it. This is 67, 68, 71, 73, 
okay, when we get to 78, and then when we get to 79, okay, this is going to give us a perfect balance because this mean balances this entire set of data.